Uh, my name is Dennis Goers. I'm the uh, team leader of Sea Change, uh, which is a community of practice. And C stands for Southeast Asia, which would mean that we are far out of our district right now. Um, but actually, the community has been growing and growing, and we now focus on the whole of Asia. It's a, it's a community of practice to share uh, knowledge on um, the monitoring and evaluation of climate change interventions and related fields. And I say that because climate change doesn't stand on its own. Um, so there are the fields of uh, natural resource management, ecosystem management, climate smart disaster risk management, livelihoods, agriculture, and I'm sure I'm forgetting a few. Um, but that is just to indicate how interrelated climate change is with other fields. And also a number of cross-cutting issues uh, like equity uh, and, and gender, uh, which I was very happy to see being mentioned in the keynote. And having said that, uh, although you only see one lady here, we have two uh, facilitators who are very nice ladies. And we have a chair who's a lady, but who's uh, still coming, missing in action at the moment. Um, so we have four ladies and four men, which is the perfect gender balance. <laughs> and today we will look at climate change adaptation, monitoring and evaluation. And we will focus on the topics of complexity and attribution. And um, I will start with introducing the presenters in the hope that the uh, chair will uh, arrive as well. There is Joe. Please join us on stage. <laughs> Ms. Jo Puri is the Executive Director and Head of Evaluation of the International Initiative for Impact Evaluation. And uh, she is our main chair today and I'm, I'm proud to introduce her to you. Uh, she has over 15 years experience in the region on uh, evaluation evidence-based policy and has worked earlier for the World Bank and United Nations. Um, then we have Ms. Trisha Wind. Trisha, can you put up your hand? That's Trisha. She will be a facilitator for uh, part of this uh, session because we will we want to have the people here being active after the presentations. Uh, so Trisha is one of the facilitators, and she works for uh, International Development Research Center, uh, the evaluation unit in Canada, and uh, she makes sure that the IDRC's evaluation system. Uh, supports both accountability and learning, and we're happy to have her here. Uh, the second facilitator is uh, Ms. Marina Apka, uh, who's sitting here in the front. And she's a postdoctorate fellow uh, on in innovation and evaluation with World Fish in uh, Malaysia. Uh, she has one of the finest duty stations of Penang. I'm very jealous, although I like Phnom Penh as well. <laughs> um, last uh, but not least, um, I'll go to the presenters and I'll start here with uh, Lucy Faulkner, uh, researcher on M&E for CBA, that's uh, Community Based Adaptation, for the International Center for Climate Change and Development, ICAT, in Bangladesh. And next to her is Bruce Ravisloot, who is the Vice President uh, of Tango International, a consultancy based in... you have to help me? In Arizona. In Arizona, but with a regional office in Bangkok. Um, and he is also a climate change advisor towards, towards the CARE uh, Climate Action Network, if I say that correctly. Uh, next to him we have Mr. Uh, Tuan Duan, who is a climate change and emergency program manager for uh, Save the Children in Vietnam. And he's also the technical advisor uh, for the Asian region. Uh, we're happy to have him here as well. And then next to him we have uh, Mr. Ramchandra Kanal who is the General Secretary of the Community of Evaluators here in Nepal. And he will uh, present a number of uh, practical experiences, also from his work with uh, TAMD, uh, PPCR and CDKN. So we're very happy to have him here as well. And we end this line of fine presenters with uh, Mr. Albert Salamanca of the uh, Stockholm Environment Institute, based in um, Bangkok and he works on climate change adaptation knowledge uh, through the AKP Adaptation Knowledge Platform, uh, which unfortunately ended December 2012. But there are some very interesting lessons to be learned from the years that uh, they did their uh, good work. Um, 
Last now, I would like to give a little bit of information on this panel format, and after that I will hand over to uh, Joe, our chair. Uh, we will start with uh, four presentations of each five minutes of the four first presenters here. Um, after that we will have a very short Q&A, um, just for clarification. If there were things in these presentations that were not clear, you can ask it at that point. Uh, that it's not to have a discussion on these presentations, but it's just for clarification. After that we will move towards complexity and attribution with two presentations, and Ram Chandra will continue his presentation, that he, that he starts in the first block, and he will talk about complexity, and after that we will have Albert as well. After that we are going to do a, a little bit of group work, uh, so we want to have good discussions per table. So if you're sitting at a table with only one or two people, just feel free at that point uh, to uh, join another table that has a few more people, uh, just to facilitate that discussion. And uh, Marina and Tricia will be facilitators for, uh, for that discussion. We will put a, a question forward towards the audience and we then want to see what, what your response is out of your uh, practice uh, that you have as, a, as an M&E professional. Um, so I would like to leave it at that and I would like to hand over to Ms. John Burry of 3IE. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being here. Um, before I get the panelists to start, I did ask Dennis if um, we could start with a couple of minutes, perhaps, to just go over areas that you're probably quite familiar with uh, in terms of the common theme running through this session. And I thought I'd sort of take, uh, use my privilege as <coughs> chair to summarize those very quickly. Uh, but before I do that, I do want to thank Dennis and Paul for putting this session together and my co-chairs, Trisha and Marina. Thank you very much. Um, there are seven critical attributes about climate change that imply that evaluation and monitoring within this sector and discipline becomes even more naughty K-N-O-T-T-Y, uh, than what we experience in uh, development interventions. And for the purposes of this discussion, I started to think about what are the criteria that we want to see in, in some of in these specific systems. Um, you all know the OECD criteria, but of, of these, what is most interesting to me uh, from the OECD DAP criteria is the first one the one that talks about effectiveness. So, and this is really the big question that I think is in front of the panelists today as well as um, in front of you as, audience, as active audience members. Did the intervention or the policy have the effect that it aimed to have and how do we know? That's the big question about effectiveness. And it really then begs the question about design and methods that I'm hoping that all of you will discuss as well. Were these, were these interventions sustainable? And really sustainability uh, in the context of adaptation becomes even more important as compared to say, you know, other development interventions because we are talking about long-term change, whether we are talking about technology adoption or we are talking about behavior change, we are talking about long-term adoption. And why this has an implication for m &E systems is because the timing of evaluations then becomes really important. When should we measure impacts? When should we measure outcomes? Um, should we measure them again? How frequently should we measure them? Uh, those questions become really critical. To what extent do the methods that we have in our, in our, uh, in our quiver, so to speak, um, really provide unbiased, um, context-relevant, and evidence-based results, or evidence-based evidence, essentially, about the outcomes that we are arguing for? What are these methods, and what do we have in our in our uh, in the discipline, but also outside the discipline, that can help to inform these questions. And last but not least, um, to what extent can these help to measure 
the impact that can be attributed to the intervention. Climate change adaptation is even more complex, as the speakers will tell you, than, than most other interventions because there's a variety of scales, there's a variety of timelines, there's a variety of actors, and there's a variety of contexts that we are concerned about. It's even more critical than a lot of other interventions because the impacts of climate change are going to fall disproportionately on the developing world. And that's why it becomes even more critical that the developing world uh, answer these questions with a greater urgency than anywhere else. Second or fourth of, of four attributes, adaptation policies are chosen not just for their ability um, to, to increase resilience and reduce vulnerability, but they're also chosen for a multitude of other outcomes. And these include, for example, economic growth, increased equity, um, and which means that we have a variety then of outcomes that need to be considered every time we think about monitoring and evaluation. This adds then another layer of complexity and questions that we need to answer uh, every time we are either creating or sustaining or developing a, a, an ME system. Third or four, like I said, sustainability in, in, in this sector and in this discipline does mean that we have to think about timelines, frequency of when evaluations are undertaken and how frequently they are undertaken. And finally, um, we do need to understand costs and cost effectiveness as well as trade-offs of the interventions that we are promoting and the interventions that we are evaluating. So what are the methods that we have that help us to understand attribution, cost, cost effectiveness in a landscape which is extremely complex? And with that very modest question, I'm going to open the panel. Thank you so much. So our, our first speaker is uh, Good morning everyone, I'm going to share with you this morning a new m and &E strategy for the adaptation sphere known as Community Based Adaptation or CBA for short. This m and &E strategy has been devised for a new long term um, action research program that works with 11 NGOs working in Bangladesh called RCAB. First of all when we're looking at m and &E for CBA there are many emerging tensions that we have to focus on when we're looking at complexity. These evolve around key areas, or first of all, really um, confusion amongst practitioners, researchers and policy makers about what actually constitutes successful or effective CBA to begin with. Therefore, what do we measure for it? How do we measure it? And really importantly, who should success be defined by? When we're looking at generating effective CBA practice on the ground that builds sustainable long-term adaptation for climate vulnerable groups to uncertain climate change impacts, there are many stakeholders, as Joe has just said, that need to be involved. Therefore, a one-size-fits-all m and approach is not going to work. We need to be looking at creating multi-track m and strategies. In order to inform the multi-track strategy we have developed under RCAB, we have first undertaken um, to design a collaborative participatory theory of change with all our NGO partners. This has helped us to establish, first of all, what should we be measuring for CBA effectiveness? Why is it important and for whom is it important? Um, I'll go for this just in brief to explain my next slide. The key goal of our RCAB programme is transformed resilience for the climate vulnerable poor. This means climate vulnerable groups undertaking long-term sustainable adaptation to uncertain climate change, not current climate variability, but long-term climate change impacts. Um, our theory of change has enabled us to design four pathways which help us reach this goal. 
These are resilience needs to be scaled out, i.e. effective CBA needs to reach more people. Resilience needs to be scaled up, i.e. effective CBA needs to main be mainstreamed across institutions from local to international scales. CBA needs to be um, transformative beyond business as usual DRR and development approaches. This involves many components, including working on a better bottom-up empowerment paradigm and helping people plan in anticipation of uncertainty. And lastly, resilience needs to be sustainable over time. Therefore, we need to make sure that when a project cycle ends, that the um, stakeholders involved in it are still reaping the benefits. So this is our RCAB theory of change in total. I know you can't read the specific outcomes. The point of me putting this slide in is to show the different stakeholders across scales that we need to create M&E for. This involves the community and the climate vulnerable poor that we're working with. This involves the institutions that we need to engage to deliver adaptation benefits for climate vulnerable poor groups. It also involves um, AP stands for Action Partners. Like I said, we're working with 11 INGOs and we're also working with national and international research partners to together work, work out what is effective CBA, what is working and what is not. Lastly, um, we're also working with the wider community of practice across national and international scales. So all these stakeholders have different information needs that we need to respond to. For example, as an action partner or an INGO, they want to know why are we, what are we experiencing that's different from being involved in RCAB, and how do we know what we're doing is going to lead to transformed resilience. Um, this means helping to build adaptive capacity of climate vulnerable groups on the ground, as well as working to capacitate local um, and international um, institutions to deliver adaptation benefits. When we're looking at the wider, um, so sorry, so the climate vulnerable poor, they want to know information such as how do we know what we're being, what we're, what we're doing is going to work, and they need to measure the performance of service delivery agents. And the wider community of practice might like to know why CBA, why should we invest in this approach over other adaptation strategies. So this has led to us to um, develop a multi-track M&E strategy. Um, there are four tracks, the first being participatory monitoring and evaluation. We are largely going to use an approach that has been devised by our partners CARE and IIED called PMEL, um, Participatory Monitoring, Evaluation, Reflection and Learning for CBA. The next track is um, measuring progress of CBA across our CAB sites. This means we've devised a framework which has been adapted from IIED's TAMD approach and we have also developed upstream and downstream indicator areas and we're going to be measuring knowledge, capacity and practice in these components. Next, we also need to be measuring INGO capacity and measuring how they're getting on and um, helping support the delivery of transformed resilience. Lastly, for m of Community of Practice, we are currently devising this m and strategy at the moment, but we're doing this in conjunction with um, some work IID are currently working on. So if we put this all together, when we're looking at climate change adaptation, we need to be developing flexible m and &E approaches that allow us to learn from and for change. So we can see here that what information is generated at community level would fit in and um, inform also what lessons are being learned across RCAB at wider scales and vice versa. Lastly, the challenge of attribution. Um, RCAB is what needs a rigorous approach as we want to be generating and disseminating evidence on CBA effectiveness for international peer review journals. Um, to do this, um, is where the process is under development. As I said, we're working with 11 INGOs who all have their own institutional setup, so it's a very challenging um, aspect for us to be looking at. But we're looking at severely capacity building NGOs and working together on um, how to make this happen. And as I said before, moving towards more transformative long term approaches. Thank you. And now we have uh, Bruce, who's going to talk about resilience measurement.
Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm standing here in two capacities. Um, one as um, part of a firm that does uh, M&E. Uh, we do M&E for a whole range of partners, m and &E system design, baselines, evaluations, the whole works. Uh, but I'm also standing here as uh, Care International's Adaptation Advisor for Asia. So coming from both worlds. Um, the questions for today were, uh, or the issues for today were complexity and attribution. So I'll talk specifically to those. What we're facing in climate change adaptation in terms of complexity is that it's very hard, at least from a practitioner's point of view, to understand how climate change shocks and stresses are different from other shocks and stresses that we encounter in our work. And one way that a range of organizations are getting around that is by looking at resilience as a much broader paradigm, a much broader concept. Um, and there are organizations that are shifting away from climate change adaptation specifically to a more bro broader uh, and a more pronounced definition of resilience. And again, resilience is not a term we should throw around loosely. You need to know very carefully what you mean with it. But once you get that definition down and once you, for your organization, know what, it, what you're trying to do with it, it's, it's a useful framework. It allows you to capture the complexity more broadly. Um, and once things can get articulated, they become less complex. If you leave climate change adaptation outside of a resilience framework, you're ignoring a lot of the context, uh, a lot of shocks and stresses, which if you don't give them a place, um, it's very hard to actually uh, take account of them. There are a lot of frameworks right now being developed. I was uh, chatting to a colleague just now, uh, maybe three, four years ago, everyone in adaptation was doing toolkits <coughs> in terms of how to design adaptation programs. Now everyone's doing M&E kits uh, in terms of how to measure uh, these, uh, these programs. Um, and every organization has its own framework, and it's the same way in resilience. So there's a parallel process with, uh, with partners like WFP, EFAT, FAO, uh, who are trying to get their heads around resilience. And what we're finding, and this comes out of a consultation we had last week in Rome, is that when you look at all the frameworks, you know, there's, there's different ways to analyze information, but the indicators and the variables are, to a large extent, very much the same. And that's a good thing, because it, there are, we, we do know how to measure these, and, and we should try and draw on that experience. Um, many of the measurement challenges also remain the same and are not specific to the program or to, the, or to the, the theme climate change or resilience. They're more general, they're more institutional. Um, so what is actually different in terms of resilience measurement and climate change measurement? Um, uncertainty. Um, a much stronger qualitative approach that looks at people's aspirations, um, uh, where they want to be in life, because that affects how they, how they manage risks and the types of decisions they make in, in um, uh, around livelihoods, um, the use of science, uh, especially when, when the science hasn't been downscaled properly for us to use it properly. So that makes the whole thing even more complex, but again, the resilience framework um, is useful. Another thing that came out of this is that we're talking too much, we're wasting a lot of time actually, talking about the what, what we should be looking at, what we should be measuring, and I was in a, a meeting a couple of weeks back and someone pulled out a paper that talked about resilience and then gave some key points and people loved it and the paper was 15 years old. <laughs> Same points. Um, and we're not focusing enough on the how. And why is the how important? And I think it was mentioned earlier as well by Joe. This resilience, climate change adaptation, whatever you want to call it, it's a process. It means frequent measurement. It's not looking at a static outcome. You need to do this ongoing on an ongoing basis. So we have to shift from baseline, midterm, end line to outcome monitoring of key variables over time. Doing that properly and doing that continuous. Otherwise, you will not know whether communities, households, whatever your unit of analysis is, whether they will be resilient over time to shocks and stresses before or after they occur. What are the resilience levels? Um, and we need to think more about good practices out there like, as I said, outcome monitoring, uh, lot quality assurance sampling, which are very cost-effective ways to uh, measure, for example, adoption rates of fortified varieties. There's all this stuff out there which is useful to all of us that we can actually pick up and start using, which we're not getting to because we're still stuck on the what we should be looking at. We're looking at the same thing, all of us actually. Indicators, variables, it's all very, very much the same. There are different nuances depending from which organization you come and uh, the, the, the entry point you take. All right, that was actually the, the most of my spiel, so I'll go through, through the rest of the slides quite quickly. Um, this is what, what Tango put together. When, when, when our clients, a couple of years ago, our partners, sorry, not our clients, our partners came up and said to us, well, um, you're evaluating a large USAID Title II food security program. Could you please look at climate change as well and or resilience? And, you know, we needed to do that. So we actually looked at our existing analytical frameworks and actually found that to a large extent we're already addressing those issues. 
Um, so again, not going to go into too much detail. Basically, what we're saying is there are different domains you need to do your measurements in. Before making it too complicated, do we know how to measure in those domains? Yes, we do. Right? There's different types of indicators. Some are good, some are bad. There's a whole range of food security indicators which are not always vetted. But we know how to measure these things. So let's go back to the basics. And in these domains, do the measurements that are relevant to your design and keep track of it that way. Try and keep it simple. Um, a couple of small things. One minute left. All right. A couple of small things that we need to just, just uh, that I already touch on. <laughs> context is essential. All right. So we, we, we don't actually do context measurements. In, in our m &E for a lot of our programs. Uh, but that determines uh, people's aspirations, uh, enabling environment, it all becomes very, very, very different. It actually becomes a factor when you look at, at long-term 10, 15, 20 year programming, which is what resilience and adaptation is. Uh, temporal considerations, regular measurements over time. Ideally, we do panel studies, but that's not always possible. That's expensive. Uh, so how do you then use cross-sectional studies in, in, in a way that's useful? Understanding that there are thresholds, tipping points. Um, in resilience programming or climate change adaptation, there are points where after which people make a certain change in their livelihoods, transform if you will, that their resilience or vulnerability pathway changes. You need to recognize those to know when and how to measure them. Um, aspirations, motivations, we've talked about that. The fact that we need to look at higher level measurement. A lot of what we do is household measurement. Um, and we're even trying to disaggregate it now into men and women measurement, but what about the higher levels? Natural resource ecosystem health, but the final point, the most important one, and then I'll go to my final slide, I'll skip seven slides, um, is technical capacity. Adaptation, climate change, resilience is a complex issue and there are no shortcuts. It requires complex measurement. <laughs> um, I was presenting um, uh, to some, some climate colleagues a while back and we, for the first we talked about things such as factor analysis and principal components. I remember people in the room being surprised because I haven't heard that in such a long time. But you need to look at statistical modeling and these types of things where we try and build variables into indexes and, and you know, not everything needs to be quantified and how does that then fit with quant qualitative information and participatory approaches. It's a very complex affair. So let's not try and oversimplify it again. Let's lay out what the components are and, and look at our existing experience in the sectors and the development scheme um, on, on how to measure those things. So again, complex analysis and mixed methods required. It's very complex. Final slide. Skip through. So these are, these are organizations, uh, sorry, that are already working on, on resilience measurement right now, a whole range. Um, yeah, another one minute, yeah, okay. Um, in terms of measuring resilience, what, what came out of, out, of, out of these consultations so far? Five things you need to focus on and get your measurements sorted out. Measurement of shocks, right? Now there's different ways to do that. There's household survey modules that can be used. There's also work done, for example, by Tufts University looking at a shock index which is which quite ground, ground, groundbreaking, will create a lot of waves in the future. Looking at coping strategies, short-term strategies, adaptive, and there's, there's indicators for that, coping strategy index, etc. Looking at adaptive capacity, right, longer-term changes, um, and that a lot of that is around your, your, your assets, uh, live your diversification, which isn't always a good thing. Um, and then transformative capacity, and finally, your well-being indicators. All right. Final point, attribution versus contribution. Um, I, I, I hope I'm not oversimplifying it, so the, so the chair please tell me if I am. But when, when we start talking about attribution and contribution, the first thing that came to mind is that for longer term programs like um, climate change or resilience, which are not the three to five year pro, you know, projects, you cannot talk about attribution. It's always about contribution to a large extent. Uh, because you're looking at higher level outcome indicators, which a lot of people, if you design your program right, a lot of organizations are contributing to. All right? That's what the theory of change does. It tells us what we want to do over 15 years. It tells us which part we can work on and which parts others have to work on. And you don't really get into the, the details about who did what. Together, you're achieving a longer term goal. And that, that measurement is around how you contribute to that. And a lot of that is about how effective one intervention is versus another intervention. Whereas attribution would be more suitable uh, as, uh, in, in exploring individual projects. So has, has, has a project that you may be implementing in year seven to 10 of your theory of change, has that, is there attribution between that project and whatever the intermediate the direct outcome of that project is. So it, when, when we talk about attribution versus contribution, good design, get a theory of change, sort out, and now I have to stop. Thanks for indulging a bit of extra time, appreciate it.
Thank you, Bruce. Uh, now we have Tuan, who's going to talk about the application of knowledge, attitude, and practice in climate change adaptation, monitoring, and evaluation systems. Good morning, everyone. Um, talking about uh, complexity in um, climate change adaptation, uh, what uh, we'd like to um, share with you here is some very um, specific um, hands-on experience when we were um, using um, KAP survey in climate change adaptation programs in Vietnam. Um, probably everybody's uh, relatively uh, familiar with KAP, which is a uh, population-based uh, survey to collect information about uh, knowledge, uh, attitude, and practice around a specific um, issue. And uh, very widely, it is used to measure the change in the levels of uh, knowledge, uh, attitude, and practices. Uh, and it is widely used because it's uh, relatively easy to use tool, uh, cost-effective, and uh, at the same time, it could give you quantifiable data to, um, for your analysis. So um, my dissertation is very much on how the KAP survey is used in climate change adaptation and what are the lessons we learned from here we would like to share with you. It's not much about uh, the, the methodology itself, the baseline survey, or the statistics, or sampling techniques. Uh, first of all, um, the KAP survey was uh, very much uh, uh, developed back in the 50s with uh, population survey and then child nutrition. Uh, typically, you have very well thought, very well established uh, conceptual framework that gives you a very good idea about how knowledge would lead to attitude and then practice which is not the case for climate change given the complexity and the newness of climate change adaptation that involves a whole lot of different uh, contributing factors. So one of the lessons we've learned is that we have to really spend time on this and taking into consideration all different factors. Uh, and a major lesson we've learned is that given the knowledge some people may, as you know, not practice what supposed to be a healthy uh, disaster preparedness um, uh, uh, practices. In terms of the, the uh, protocol, uh, in many of the surveys, um, uh, we know that the protocol is supposed to lead out, uh, it's a roadmap, it includes uh, all the key questions, the objectives, the sampling uh, methodology, um, one of them is kind of tricky when you apply it in climate change adaptation uh, programs is that when you define the study unit, um, obviously we would like to look at um, household and then it's uh, quite tricky to pick up who from the household would be your interviewee. It's um, relatively obvious in other programs such as child nutrition because you know you're going to take the try uh, caregiver, but in this one, it really depends on specific context. It might be, especially um, in the context that you find uh, many households that has uh, more than one generation, then it would be tricky for you to look at, to pick up the younger couple or older couple, and this really depends on the household dynamics. And of course, you know, you have to, you have to, uh, pay attention on making sure that you have uh, a good balance between male and female respondents. Uh, 
Um, and again, um, language and uh, translation has been highlighted in, in many uh, survey guidelines, but um, in a hurry, we tend to um, skip you know, different items on our agenda. And again, I can't emphasize enough how important translation could be, especially when you talk about um, climate change adaptation that involves quite, uh, quite a relatively new terminology and in some indigenous um, communities, some of the terms just don't make sense. I want to skip this one because I uh, probably uh, you would be more interested in um, hearing more about field um, data collection um, experience. Um, obviously, you know, in, in, in some um, settings, especially in Asia, we got to deal with uh, courtesy bias, which is really important because you know, people tend to tell you what they, they think you would like to hear which is not, you know, climate change adaptation is not an exception. So it's really important for us to create a, uh, a setting that is uh, more friendly to community members for them to speak out. Um, the other thing is, it's kind of a debate. Uh, we have had different um, um, challenges in recruiting uh, enumerators uh, some would go for people who have prior experience, and some would go for kind of clean people who have no prior experience. And I tend to go to the, the latter one, and it's simply because um, the climate change adaptation requires, because it's new, it requires a lot of coping uh, during the interview. And many, you know, when we do too much coping, we ended up with a lot of, you know, agreeing answers, which is kind of quite a, a bias, systematic bias. Um, we usually use, um, typically for attitude, uh, we typically use uh, attitude statements and requests for uh, yes or no answer. And in uh, Asian culture, they tend to say yes. They tend to agree with you. And one of the lessons we learned is that we transform all the attitude statements into direct question. And that is a major um, learning um, during uh, our application of uh, KAP in our work. Um, and I'm um, running out of time. So the last uh, point I, I, uh, wanna, I wanna make is that um, during our uh, interventions, we've used the results of this KAP um, uh, survey in defining the incentive allowance for community facilitators based on the progress they have made in terms of the levels of knowledge, attitude, and practices of the target population. It was extremely difficult at the beginning but we were able to convince the community leaders to use that and, and the, it has a tremendous impact on our program. Thank you. Thank you, Tuan. That was uh, very astutely summarized and I'm, 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 thank you so much for um, going through your presentation but capturing the main points of uh, the slides that you wanted to communicate to the audience. Um, we now have Mr. Ramchandra, who's going to be talking about learning from um, CDKN and other experiences in Nepal in the context of climate change uh, adaptation. say all the slides will be made available on Sea Change and also on the Evaluation Conclave website, so don't worry if some slides are being skipped. Thank you, Chair mm -hmm. of these sessions and all ladies and gentlemen. 
And my presentation is basically focused on that uh, what we learn from Nepal and what we see things in Nepal. That's why, as Dennis already uh, mentioned that earlier, that's the I, my presentation will be in two parts. That's the in the first part that I will be presenting basically the what is the uh, systems and institutions related to evaluation in Nepal, and uh, in the second part that I will be talking about the complexities. Now, now it's. Uh, Probably it might be difficult for you to read from um, from uh, behind, but the what uh, uh, I'm just trying to show the what is the evaluation systems in, uh, in relation to climate change in Nepal, and just to uh, say very briefly that the we have uh, the higher apex level that's the chair by right on the prime minister uh, uh, through this uh, climate change council that is the highest. Uh, policy making body that we have in Nepal, which is, uh, I mean, uh, chaired by the Prime Minister, but there will be lots of ministries within that. Now again, we have uh, other uh, other committee that which is chaired by the Minister of Environment, and that includes the, all the projects and programs that we run in Nepal. Again, that to coordinate and to facilitate the process that we have another uh, coordination committee which we call MCCICC that is the multi-stakeholder climate change coordination committee which is chaired by the uh, secretary of the ministry of science technology and environment again we have another chair that is chaired by the joint secretaries of the ministry and i mean just time what i'm trying to say is that there, there are lots of committees uh, to uh, steer the climate change related proje projects and program in Nepal. And that is something that when we have other projects implemented by the by other uh, donor agencies or the development partners, that is also in a way that connected with the Ministry of you know, Science, Technology and Environment. And we have also seen uh, some projects that that is outside the government uh, uh, government's jurisdiction or they are working in, the, in their own way, not reporting uh, to the ministry directly. What we see is that the, we have uh, very good mechanisms instituted. I mean, see, if you see the, from prime minister to, to under secretary level that we have very good uh, mechanism, but those mechanisms are basically uh, for, I mean, just uh, talk shop, you know, let's say we have meetings, we talk about that, but I mean, there are some good learnings out of that also, but if you participate there and you and try to find out that whether, I mean, that we, we have actually uh, the, the attributes of the evaluation that we should be having on those uh, programs or, or in that meetings or that in that kind of institutions, but probably we are more on uh, monitoring than actually using the evaluation perspective in those meetings. Now, if you see that the same thing that just I'm trying to projectize as the how the different projects are working uh, at the field levels and how that is tied up with the different program that at national level and how that is supporting to NAPA, that's Nepal Adaptation, uh, National Adaptation Program of Actions and we also have climate change policy in Nepal in 2011. Then I mean that's the there is there is also link. I mean there's uh, sometimes there is uh, that we find some some sort of mandatory process that need to be uh, reported to the uh, to NAPA and climate change policies, and that again that would again um, report back to the development partners like SIF, SPCS, DFID, UNDP, or UN. And that kind of arrangement is there. Now arrangement is there, but. To, are we really getting a very good learning out of that or we are doing those kind of uh, things in a ritual basis? I mean that we can argue that certainly that we have some sort of good learning but at the same time that there are lots of things that we can improve. Now again that's the, the some of the uh, project project that you see that the SPCR this is a PPCR project then just I take one example there are good uh, good attempts also and that you can see the indicators there and the, that project is also trying to create kind of baseline and what will achieve after five years or three years or whatever then 
during uh, shortage specific reporting period, the, what is the target and uh, how much actually that has been achieved and what is the percentage of target and the comments there. I mean, let's say if you see the, the, the monitoring uh, reporting, uh, this indicator reporting template, then it's uh, pretty good. I mean, let's say there, there is also uh, some uh, new initiative uh, being, uh, being started. And those monitoring and evaluation, or the, especially this whole managing result-based management systems is also I'm very much focused on the nationally driven. This using the uh, basically the national uh, system that we have, then they are, they are I mean uh, participatory, and they are also trying to use the climate science. I mean that we can argue on that to what extent that the climate science has been used, and actually that the science climate change science is also evolving and to what extent that, uh, and that we can really use. I mean, uh, we already sp uh, spoke about that. Uh, uh, now, this, this, uh, there has also been some sort of uh, uh, initiative to bring all those, uh, initi this, all these activities or the project into programmatic approach and trying to, be, uh, trying to make that a flexible system. If we take a very specific example, I mean, that's the, the indicators that we have in big projects like multi-million project, 10 million, 15 million project, and if you see the indicators that we have, I mean, that, uh, yeah, these are, these are good indicators if you, I mean, so, and you may have different uh, opinions on that, but still, uh, if you see that the, that the, something that I have written in uh, red, that's the cope with the effect of the climate change, then people can argue that what is cope, how to cope that, how we define coping, and then what is, I mean, that's the, how to create baseline. I mean, there are lots of, uh, I mean, issues that we can, we can argue on, on those things. And if you see the second indicators, that's the uh, degree of integration of climate change. What is that degree of integration? I mean, that how we define that, how we calculate that. And, and there are a whole lot of uh, indicators that the, still, in the beginning, it might be very difficult to, um, I mean, uh, difficult to properly quantify that. That's why uh, those indicators are there. But if we take the same indicators, uh, even at the last, uh, last of the project, and to try to do the evaluation prop, that it might be very risky and be very uh, difficult at the end of the uh, program. That's why just uh, there are so, so many other indicators also that I have taken a couple of indicators only. Then, just one question that uh, we have is the what is uh, whether that we have taken uh, the uh, the uh, issues that we have uh, this uh, climate change related to this complexity and attribution issues related to climate change adaptation whether we have really taken that issues uh, while developing mm -hmm. this kind of indicators is there indicators that the uh, really uh, inadequately attributed this uh, complexity and uh, attribution issues, then we can argue on that, but we can I mean, see, clearly see that those initiatives are good, but is still not adequate. I think that I will again come to the uh, second session of the presentation. Thank you.